What if I told you that you've been thinking about willpower and discipline all wrong? And as a result, you never feel like you have enough of either one to really accomplish what it is you want to accomplish. But you can change this right now. And when you do, you will pull the plug on willpower and self-discipline or the problem of willpower and self-discipline for good. But before we get started, in the description below this video is a link to a PDF. And that PDF has some of the notes that I'm going to be referring to. And one more thing before we get started, I am going to say some things that will likely challenge the way you think. It may even make you angry, okay? And the reason for that is because we really like having our beliefs confirmed because that feels good. But when it comes to change, you need to change your beliefs. You don't really have, there's no real change often without changing your beliefs. It's fine to disagree with me. That's perfectly okay. What I urge you to do is keep an open mind because I'll say some things and you'll go, oh, well, you know, I don't believe that. It doesn't, it doesn't fit for me. Okay, but are you, are you where you want to be right now? Is that belief holding that your situation in place like it is, which is not what you want? You want to change it? You're going to have to change a belief about that. Well, several years ago when I started doing yoga, it was a very strenuous form of yoga called Ashtanga. And I was doing it for about an hour and a half a day, five to six times a week. And I remember people coming to me and saying, wow, you're, you're really disciplined. You must have a lot of willpower to, to make sure that, you know, you, you do that every day. And I remember hearing that and thinking, I don't quite understand what they mean. What do, what do they mean that I'm disciplined? Somebody looked at my life and saw the yoga that I do, the jujitsu that I do, the content creation that I do here. A lot of people would say, yeah, wow, you're really disciplined. You, you make all these things happen. And I still get that compliment to this day. Now I understand it better. I understand how other people are perceiving me and I understand what's going on inside of me much more. And I understand why that doesn't quite fit. And I'll come back to this. I'll circle back to this. The main thing to understand is how words are really categories. Words are very, very important. Now there's nothing really like magical about words. A lot of times people get wrapped up in this whole idea of, you know, if I say the right words, think the right words, say the right affirmations, then somehow that's going to magically make things happen. It's not quite how it works. It's much more precise than that. And we can be a little more scientific about it. Words or categories or meanings, meanings of categories or categories of meanings, however that works out for you. And when we phrase things a certain way with certain words, we're passing our reality through those categories. And it's, so it's really important to understand what are the implications of these categories. When my mentor, Steve Andreas, was close to passing and I went to visit him, he told me that if he had more time, he knew he was dying, that he would study implication. And Milton Erickson, the father of modern hypnosis, was somebody who used a lot of implication. I don't think it was anything he ever taught, but Steve picked up on this. And ever since I had that last talk in person with my mentor, I'd been thinking about implications and how they play into the words that we use. Now, they're slightly different than presuppositions. I'm not going to get into all that. I'm not going to geek out on, on language on you right now. Uh, we can do that another time. But I want you to understand that words are categories. So we take a word like willpower or we take a word like self-discipline. And what does that really mean? So we have a category here called self-discipline. And we, we select and collect experiences that fall under that category. And that's how we make meaning of it. That's how we know what that means. When you think of self-discipline, what do you think of? Take a moment to, to think of the word and think of what that means and think about applying it to yourself. Still to this day, when I think of that word, self-discipline, I put a lot more emphasis on the second word first, discipline. And I think about the times when my parents disciplined me, the times that uh, a teacher disciplined me, all the very unpleasant experiences of being disciplined, meaning I was doing something, I had to do something, and often by some sort of force or some sort of coercion, doing something that I did not want to do. And I know this is the case for a lot of people because I coach a lot of people and I teach a lot of people. And when they get honest and they start thinking about what really pops up, what are their internal 
experiences? What are their internal images and, and voices that they hear when they think of this word self-discipline? And it's very similar a lot of the time. And then we have this word self in there. So there's this idea that I'm going to discipline myself. So I have to take all of those experiences of being disciplined, and this is probably happening for you as well. You have to take all of those experiences of being disciplined, which was not pleasant. And then you're going to say, okay, well, and I need to apply this to myself now. I need to sit myself down and make myself do something that I really don't want to do. That's where we start with when we say self-discipline and we tell ourselves, I need more self-discipline. I need to make myself do things I don't want to do. And willpower is very similar, though it sounds a, a little sexier, I think. Willpower. And we think about all those movies where the person at the climax of the movie has to dig deep and pull out some willpower that is nearly inhuman and then beat, you know, defeat the dragon or whatever it is. But there's that word power in there, which also has an implication. When we, when we think of power, and I get into this with students and clients even, and they, they bring out the word power as a value. I want more power. And I say, no, you don't really want that. Or, oh, yes, I do. And I was like, okay, well, let's, let's examine this word a little bit and let's think about what the implications are. Power implies power over something, which implies the desire to have superiority over someone or something. Now, I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking, uh, no, I don't, I don't mean it that way. I just want the power in the sense of the capability. And to that, I say, okay, great. Just pursue capability. Pursue the capability to do the thing that you want to do. Why do you need power? Where does the power come in? You know, it sounds better. It sounds sexier. It sounds like, oh, I'm going to get something that feels really good. But what do we know about power? It's not very satisfying. What do people with power want? More power. Why would someone with power want more power if power was satisfying? Because it's not satisfying. It's more like a drug. You can, you can get drunk on power, but it's not enough. Just like a drug, it's not enough. You, you get high, you start to come down, you want more. And that's what power does. So capability, yes, you want the capability, great. You don't need power because of its negative implications. And then people might say, well, no, 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 I don't want power over other people. I just want power over myself. And there again, I say there, there is the problem. That has the same problem as self-discipline, this idea that I'm going to overpower myself, this idea that I'm going to discipline myself. <laughs> Think about what this means. Think about what this implies. With self-discipline, that means I'm going to split myself into two. Well, let's put it on you. <laughs> You're going to split yourself into two, and there's going to be one part of you that does the disciplining, and then one part of you that is the disciplined. Does that really make sense? It sounds like cognitive dissonance or somewhere in that area of cognitive dissonance because you can't do that. You can't split yourself in two. You're one whole human being. I know sometimes we feel like we're scattered in parts, but you are in fact one whole being. So if you split yourself into two, that's an imaginary thing. That's a delusional thing. And it also creates an internal conflict. Again, this idea, this imaginary idea, this delusional idea that one part of me is doing the disciplining and one part of me is receiving the discipline, the discipline. So you enter into this kind of parent-child relationship with yourself. That, that's, usually, that's often enough right there for people to say, okay, I get what you're saying. This isn't the right way to go about it. What is the right way to go about it? We'll get there. Okay, we'll get there. Don't worry. I'm not going to just take away this concept from you and not replace it with something. Will, power, this idea that I have a will and then I'm going to use that power to once again, overpower myself. Again, you have to make that a delusional divide between yourself. And there's a part that's going to do the overpowering. And there's a part that's going to be overpowered. Now we're, we're entering into cognitive dissonance. That is not real. That is not how things work. That's not a reality. So if we make it our reality, we are deluding ourselves. We are splitting ourselves. We are creating an internal conflict. We're entering into this imaginary relationship with ourselves. That's just going to create a lot more pain, a lot more suffering, a lot more noise, a lot more friction, and it's going to gradually drag you down more and more. So when we say to ourselves, I need more willpower, I need more discipline, we're passing our reality through these concepts, which are very limiting and actually painful. 
and actually get in the way of you getting what you want. You don't need to divide yourself and and then try to go at something. Wouldn't you be much better off if you were fully whole, integrated, aligned, congruent with what it is that you want and you go at what you want as a whole person, fully integrated, fully focused on what it is you want? Or do you think it's better if you create a, an imaginary conflict inside of you and then fight yourself over it as you try to drag yourself to the thing that you want. So let's say you, you succeed, you overpower yourself, you discipline yourself, you defeat that other part of yourself and you win. Did you really win? No, not if part of you has been fully defeated and beaten into submission. That's that all parts of you are valid. So if you do that to a part of yourself, then part of you has been defeated and beaten and part of you can say, can pretend to win, but again, go back to thinking you're one whole human being. Is that going to be fulfilling? Is that going to be satisfying? No, it's not. And if you've ever done it before, and I have, and I'm sure you have too, where you have beaten yourself into submission, you finally accomplished something and you celebrate, what you're really celebrating is the relief that it's over because it feels like you've gone to war with yourself. But did, was it really fulfilling? Was it really satisfying? No, most of the time it's not. And this is what a lot of people are, who can build this muscle we call willpower or self-discipline. It is a muscle. You can build it. You can make it stronger. And you can go out there and accomplish some things that will really impress people and be miserable all, all, this, all along the way. Thinking, though, that it must be important because other people think it's important. But you're inside. You're corroding. Inside you're at war with yourself all the time. I don't find that to be successful. You can see people doing this. You see famous celebrities, uh, accomplished, beautiful, and yet they're depressed or even worse, they commit suicide. So great for impressing people, but if you're not happy, fulfilled, enjoying yourself, having fun, what's the point? Now, is this an either or thing? No, it's not. And like I said, we'll get there. So just think about this now from this point on, when it comes to willpower and discipline, a lot of people are beating themselves up. This is the hardest thing. This is the part, this is the thing that kind of breaks my heart because I've been there. And when I see it happening now, it really breaks my heart. People who fail to achieve the goal that they set out to achieve, and then they beat themselves up for it and believe that it's because they don't, they didn't have enough willpower or they didn't have enough self-discipline. And if that's you right now, you're going to love the rest of this because this will free you. Now, for a lot of us, it's us on occasion, right? When we finally say, yeah, I'm going to go out there and, and, and try to achieve this goal. And you say, okay, I got to, you know, rally the troops inside of me, get that willpower going, get that self-discipline going and let's go for it. And then if you fail at it or you give up, then you beat yourself up and say, ah, just didn't have enough of that willpower. Just didn't have enough of that discipline. Just remember willing in this sense, is forcing yourself. Disciplining yourself is treating yourself like a child, punitively. And that's just never going to work as well as letting these things go, letting these concepts go, and finding a much better way, which I'm, like I said, I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm going to give you something here to replace the, these ideas. Now, some of you might be very familiar with uh, David Goggins. <laughs> and right now, I'd say he's got the, the monopoly on social media when it comes to self-discipline and willpower. And the guy seems inhuman. And I, I'm, I'm right there along with everyone else. He's an, he's an impressive person. Impressive in the way that like, I can watch heavyweight bodybuilding competitions. And you see these people walk out with these freakish muscles, the combination of freakish genetics and lots and lots of steroid use, testosterone, whatever it is, and it's layered up. And you have some of these guys dropping dead on stage because they're so juiced up. It's impressive. It is impressive to look at because it looks inhuman. But I wouldn't want my body to look like that. I'm perfectly okay with being toned, muscular, and healthy, 
and not using any of those drugs, testosterone, whatever. And uh, obviously I'm not, I don't have freakish genetics. <laughs> so I've accepted that. It's impressive, but it, it's, it's not healthy and it's not, it's not fulfilling. I don't believe, uh, especially not if you're destroying your body in the process. Now, David Goggins, uh, I can't climb inside of him and know how he thinks about these things. I've listened to him speak. I bought his book. I read about a third of it before I put it down. Just wasn't interested. Um, his upbringing was miserable and he, that's not me making a judgment on him. That's what, that's how he explained it. And what I have found, and again, I'm not trying to diagnose him. I'm not a therapist and I'm not trying to say, I know how he thinks, but what I have found in my own life and many, and working with many people is people who have that kind of upbringing where they were punished a lot, they were beaten, uh, they were, you know, miserable upbringing. They have a tendency to do that to themselves when they get older. Now I wasn't beaten and all that, but I was, my, I was raised in a very strict family and very religious. So there was a lot of guilt and shame, uh, put on me when I got older and I became an adult, it was a strange thing. Now my parents aren't around. So what do I do? I shift into fulfilling that role that they played in my life. Cause it was a huge role. Otherwise I would have felt lost. So then how do I fulfill that role? Well, I treat myself into that parent child relationship and I shame and guilt myself to get myself to do the things that I feel like I should be doing. Uh, this is a miserable way to live, but a lot of us don't realize that, that we're doing that to ourselves. It takes a lot of work on yourself typically to bring this to the surface. So it's a pattern I've seen. And it's a pattern that somebody like Goggins might be using to drive himself. And then again, Goggins may be using willpower and discipline, and he may be one of those sort of, like I was referring to, like genetic, uh, freakish genetics that these heavyweight bodybuilders have. He might have something in his DNA that is like a, a freakish uh, willpower and, and way of disciplining himself that just, you know, if you compare him to most people, he's way up here, just like those bodybuilders are way up here. But here's the thing, willpower and discipline, as strong of a muscle that you can build in that area, it will give out at some point, just like a muscle will give out at some point. You know, you're not going to be able to bench press 3000 pounds, just never going to happen. The muscle at some point reaches its capacity and it just can't do that. So not enough, there's no such thing as enough willpower and discipline that's ever going to get you there. So like I said, I don't know what's going on with that guy, but I can say <laughs> it doesn't appear to be very satisfying and fulfilling. And he, I don't know about now, but in the, his past, he's done a lot of these fluctuations where he's like, he's gained a bunch of weight and then he's dropped like, I don't know, 40 pounds in two weeks and um, something like that. That's not healthy. Okay. So I hope he's found whatever piece, you know, he needs to find. But I, I find that a lot of people who are not at peace with themselves do a lot of this willpower and self-disciplining kind of behavior and kind of patterns. And, and we can grow out of them and we can find better ways of doing things. And, and that's what I will eventually get to is, is you can do the things that will impress people. I wouldn't recommend that you do it to impress people. Because oftentimes that might be, a, again, a reason why we want to drag in willpower and discipline because, hey, if I do this and these people think I'm important, and if they think I'm important, that's going to validate me in some way. It's not. It's really not. And even if it did, then you're at the mercy of these people validating you, giving you that attention, and you don't control that. So you're always chasing it. And then when you don't get it, then you feel resentful and bitter. And that's not going to help you get what you want. It's not going to help you be more fulfilled and satisfied in your life. So instead of screaming and yelling and on your, at yourself and trying to push yourself and force yourself and on and on and on, let's take something really simple that I know you do and you've been doing it for a long time and you've been doing it consistently like twice a day. When people come to me, when clients come to me and they say, you know, I, I need more willpower and discipline. I'll say, oh, really? I'll say, okay. I say, do you brush your teeth? And they say, well, of course. I say, Twice a day? Yeah. And some people say three times a day. And I say, how long have you been doing that? Ever since I can remember, years and years and years, you know, however old they are. 
that minus, you don't know, I don't know, one year <laughs> because you start having teeth at one year. And I just say, where did you get the willpower and the discipline to do that? That's, that's a long time. And that's amazing consistency. How did you get the willpower and self-discipline to brush your teeth every single day, twice a day? You know, maybe you skip some every <laughs> once in a while, but you keep it up and they will go, well, I don't use willpower and discipline. And I say, exactly. That's how you do things consistently and for a lifetime doing something that really lasts. And I go, whoa, I don't, I don't even know how he did that. I don't even know how, I don't even know how I, I, I was able to, I'm able to pull that off anymore. And then after that happens, my clients usually stop brushing their teeth at that point because now they feel the need to use willpower and discipline to do it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> that doesn't happen. So yeah, think about that. And then, and brushing your teeth is not the only thing that you do consistently. You can find plenty of things that you do consistently over and over that if you introduced the ideas of willpower and discipline and you suddenly put that in your way, you would see that as more of an obstacle to do it. So how is it you're able to do that? Again, we'll come back to that. So I want you to start thinking in terms of empowerment versus enforcement. So willpower, self-discipline, that's about enforcement. What about empowerment? Now, believe it or not, the idea of empowerment, that's really what gets you brushing your teeth every day. You don't need power. You need empowerment, meaning you know what you want. You're clear about it and you're committed to it. That's what empowerment is. You don't need power to do that. And maybe, maybe you need a capability. Maybe you need to know how to do that. And at one time you didn't know how to brush your teeth. Your parents taught you. And after a while, you cultivated that capability. And probably for the first several years that you were brushing your teeth, the only reason why you did it was because your parents made you do it. And if you didn't, maybe they disciplined you. They made, maybe they bribed you too. Maybe they incentivized you to do it. Why? Because you didn't understand why you were doing it. it you, you didn't have the connection just yet of why you wanted to have all of your teeth instead of them rotting and falling out and that you wanted to have good breath. Like you hadn't made those connections yet. So you needed your parents to sort of discipline you to do it. But when you're an adult, you don't need your parents to do that anymore. Hopefully, I hope your, <laughs> I hope your parents aren't uh, calling you up and being like, hey, you did, you know, did you brush your teeth this morning? Did you brush your teeth tonight? No, you've got this, right? And you can do it without any disciplining yourself or willing yourself to do it. When it comes to the things you want to accomplish, how much do you understand what excites you about that? A lot of people don't. It's, it's really strange to me. When, whenever somebody comes to me and, and they say, okay, I have this goal. This is what I want to achieve. I, first thing I do is a values elicitation. And now that I'm mentioning it, mentioning values elicitation, we'll throw a PDF after, at the end of the stream. We'll throw a PDF in there for values elicitation. It's the most important thing. And, I, and if you watch a lot of my videos, you've heard me talk about values elicitation endlessly. And because that's where it really all starts. You have to start connecting with what is beyond the, the surface of what you want, because that's where your motivation actually is. Your values are your motivation. If you're not connected to that, makes it very difficult for you to get what you want. We often will take on goals that are not what we really want. And a lot of times when I do a value solicitation with someone around something they want, half the time they realize the goal, the initial goal that they thought they wanted, they don't want it. They realize that the reason why they want it is because of outside values, outside pressures, status, the appearance of being, of impressing, of being impressive or impressing others. And you realize real quickly, if you pursue that, maybe you will impress people, but the fulfillment of that is so short lived. And like I said, when you don't get it, cause you don't control what other people think and what they feel about you, you'll turn to resentment and anger. And that's certainly not going to help you get what you want. 
And then you're always at the mercy of other people's way of thinking about you. It's no way to live. So when you do a value solicitation, you, you see beyond the surface, beyond the initial goal. And you really connect with what is motivating you to do something. And that is rooted in your potential. You'll feel it. But you'll never reach your potential as long as you're relying on discipline and willpower. It's just noise. It's an obstacle. It's something you're putting in your way. And it's dividing you in half. When you're clear about your values, it will help unite you. It'll help integrate you. Now, when you're pursuing something like a goal and you don't know what your values are, we feel like it's kind of a carrot on a stick kind of thing. We're chasing that carrot. And we're usually not enjoying ourselves because we haven't really understood the goal. We haven't really understood our values behind it. We just tell ourselves, when I catch up to the carrot, when I catch up to the goal, when I accomplish this thing, when I turn that corner, there's fulfillment. There's some sort of joy, fun, relaxation, peace, happiness, whatever it is. But if you're not enjoying the process, if the journey isn't fulfilling as you're going toward it, that's a really good clue that when you finally catch up to it, if you do, it, there's not going to be much fulfillment in it. When you're chasing something down and it's painful and there's suffering, when you get there, don't think that it's all going to rain down on you and everything's going to be great because it's not. For two reasons. One, were you going after that based on your actual values, the fulfillment of your, your, your actual values? If you were, it would have felt fulfilling through the destination, not just at the end of it, not just when you get there. As you're going toward the destination, you will experience fulfillment if you're in alignment with your values. And that's what is that lasting motivation. You don't need to look for motivation. You don't need willpower. You don't need discipline if you're aligned with your values, because the very alignment of your behavior with your values creates fulfillment. It also cre is what creates self-esteem. It's also what creates confidence. So that's one reason. The other reason is maybe this actually did align with your values, but you're imposing this discipline. You're imposing your will on yourself because you're still passing your reality through these concepts, which just divide you and create conflict and friction. So you might even be aligning with your values, but when you're imposing discipline and willpower, willpower, you're causing yourself to suffer needlessly. It's also taking away your attention and dividing your efforts toward what it is that you want. When you could be going at this as a fully integrated whole human being going toward what it is that you want. And that will be fulfilling enough. And the motivation you're going to experience from that is going to be the fuel that's going to get you to the destination. And when you get to the destination, it's not as big of a deal. It's sort of like, great, I did it. And I'm enjoying myself. I'm, I was already fulfilled. So I don't feel this desperation or a sense of scarcity that I had to like grab on to that, to that goal and that accomplishment. And, you know, like times when you've chased things so much and you finally wrapped your hands around it, but more than likely would probably happen is it felt like the, the more effort you put into it, the more it, it, you pushed it away. But when you're integrated, it's different. I think about this too. If you're going after something, oftentimes, and you're using discipline and willpower, oftentimes it's about trying to prove something. Who are you trying to prove? What are you trying to prove and to whom? People might say, well, I'm trying to prove it to myself. Okay. <laughs> Again, you're dividing yourself. One part of you that's sitting back and saying, okay, prove it to me. And then another part of you that's saying, okay, I'm going to try. Again, dividing yourself. But a lot of times we're trying to prove it to other people. And that becomes problematic as well. Because there, there's just not a lot of fulfillment in that. Now, it is possible to do what's fulfilling for you and also impress other people. And that's what was happening for me when I was doing yoga six days a week or any other time I've gotten that compliment of, oh, you're very disciplined. I was like, okay. <laughs> and it was weird to me because I wasn't trying to impress anyone. That's just it. I was enjoying myself. 
why do I need discipline or willpower? That was my, that was the question I was asking myself when I get this compliment, I was like, okay, you know, discipline seems to me like that thing. My parents and my teachers and whoever other authority figures were imposing on me. That's not what's happening here. I'm enjoying myself. That's why I want to go to yoga every day. That's why I want to practice for an hour and a half going to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu went this morning. I was looking forward to it. I enjoy it. When I was done, I was like, wow, okay, I'm exhausted. I had a great time. I'm enjoying it. Why, where's the discipline in this? Okay. Yeah. I, I can see how the appearance of it looks like, you know, I'm sparring with someone I'm sweating, I'm struggling. Uh, we're trying to, you know, submit each other to an outside perspective that might look very unpleasant and very uncomfortable, but I'm having a good time. And that's, what's important. Just being clear about what you enjoy, what you want without division, without some sort of internal conflict, without this idea of imposing on myself. If you're just clear about what you want, there's your motivation. That's motivation. Clarity is motivation. When you are clear about something and be careful what you're clear about, by the way, because your unconscious doesn't know what you consciously want or don't want. It only knows the clarity you put in front of it. So most people pay more attention and are more clear about what they don't want than what they do want. And so your unconscious just goes, okay, well, there's the clarity. The clarity is that thing that you don't want. It doesn't know that you don't want it, but it's, you know, if you're so focused on avoiding the things that you don't want, that's where it's going to take you. Your unconscious will lead you there. And then your conscious mind has to step in and say, whoa, 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 we don't want that. And then your conscious mind starts getting confused and it's like, why do I always keep making the same mistakes? Why do I always keep putting myself in the same problematic situations? Why am I always undercutting my own success and accomplishments? What are you communicating to your unconscious? What are you feeding it? Because if the diet of information you're feeding your unconscious is clarity about all the things that you don't want, it doesn't know any different. It just knows that's where we go because your unconscious will do anything to avoid confusion and chaos. So be careful what you're clear about. And it's okay to know what you don't want. I'm not saying don't know that. It's good to know that. Um, it was a, I always forget his name, famous record producer. And I know his last name is Iovine. He said, fear makes a great tailwind, but it doesn't make a good headwind. And that's exact, that metaphor is a beautiful way of explaining what I just said. Good to know what you don't want, not good to focus on what you don't want, not good to focus on what you fear. And for the simple reason that you can't move toward what you want by focusing on what you don't want. It's like you, you can't go forward while you're focusing on what's behind you. If you go to a, a clothing store, clerk comes up to you and says, what can I help you with? And you say, I don't want socks. <laughs> and the clerk's going to say, okay, I won't show you any socks. What do you want? And then you say, I don't want shirts. You could be there all day, possibly longer by process of elimination, <laughs> finally finding what you want when all along, all you had to do was just say, I want pants or I want jeans. And the clerk would go, okay, let's take you there. That's how your unconscious works. You want your unconscious to take you somewhere, even when you're not consciously focusing on, on it. And even when you're not even seemingly putting effort into it. You got you to gotta give the clear instructions to your unconscious what it is that you want. You got to show it. What does it look like? What does it sound like? And if you focus on that, your unconscious will get that memo and it will start taking you there. So clarity is very magnetic. Clarity is so magnetic. Ma magnetic. It will take you to, the, to what your unconscious will take you to what you're clear about. And so this also uh, brings in words like organized and focused. You know, if you're organized and focused, if you organize your thoughts about what you want and you put your focus on the things that you want, you don't need willpower. You don't need discipline because you're fully congruent with those things that you want and you're clear about it. And trust me, your unconscious is more powerful than your conscious mind. It's bigger. And when you're feeding it that clarity and it's organized, it will take you there. And then when you're conscious, you're putting in the conscious effort 
you just kind of create that cycle. You're putting in the conscious effort. You're creating more organization, more clarity consciously. That reaches your unconscious. And then even while you sleep, it's propelling you in that direction. And so you get this cycle going between your conscious and your unconscious. Now, what do you think happens when you impose discipline and willpower? You're creating a divide between your conscious and your unconscious. You're confusing it. You're giving it confusing communication because your unconscious is like, wait a minute. There's not a parent and child here. <laughs> There's not a part that's overpowering the other part. There's not a part here that's disciplining the other part. That's a delusional thing fed to the unconscious from your conscious mind. So you're giving it really weird communication. Consequently, you're going to get weird back from your unconscious. So organize and focus your thoughts. That will help you gain clarity about what it is you want. And then when you have that, you know your values. Very, very important. You got to know what's beyond. Bruce Lee used to say, don't punch the person. Punch inches, a few inches beyond the target. And that's what knowing your values does. You see beyond the target of the thing that you're going after. You connect with the value that you're after. It's already inside of you. And that connects you with that motivation, which is just you seeking your potential. Conduction and electricity. What causes conduction in an electricity? Potential. That electricity is seeking potential to conduct. Same here. Your potential wants to, your, your motivation is seeking your potential, that conduction. And when you show it that potential by being clear and organized, it's very natural just to move toward that without resistance, without having to try to overpower yourself. And then commitment, when you really commit to something, and it's not committing to something because you want to commit to it, that's committing to it because you're congruent with what you're committing to. You're clear about what you're committing to. There's no resistance. And that's another thing that can happen. I could probably do a whole video on our stream on uh, resistance and dealing with it because that is a very real thing. And there's there's many, I want to say there's many reasons, but there's many things that can come up that's resistance. One of them just being you gave yourself instructions at a much younger age about something not to do. And that part of you is just following those instructions. And so if you're experiencing resistance, the self-help personal development thing out there will just say, you know, bulldoze over it. If you can't, you must, you got to push through it. You got to, you know, it's like, no, no, and no, that does not work. And even if it does from time to time, because it will, you, it will not be fulfilling. Okay. You need to understand that resistance. You need to invite it to the table. It's a part of you and all parts of you are valid. So stop trying to play this game with yourself or this narrative in your mind that you need to, you know, defeat the enemy. Well, if part of you is what you're calling the enemy, then you're just defeating yourself. So you invite the resistance. You find out what is its positive intention for you. It always has a positive intention. Doesn't mean the behavior or whatever the resistant behavior is positive. It just means that whatever it's trying to do for you is trying to fulfill a value for you. It's trying to lead you to greater fulfillment. And what you probably just need to do is update the instructions for it. But I, I assure you, you're the one responsible for that resistance. You gave a part of yourself certain instructions. Like if you were a kid and you got embarrassed and you told yourself, never do that again, never put yourself out there or never get, be embarrassed ever again. I don't want to ever be embarrassed ever again. That part of you says, okay, and it follows, that's its mission. And then later you need you have situations where you really want to put yourself out there. Like you want to, uh, cold approach someone, or you, uh, want to step up and start a YouTube channel or do a podcast or whatever. And you're crippled by the fear of putting yourself out there and you don't even know where it's coming from. Well, you gave yourself the instructions to never get embarrassed ever again. Well, one way you'll never get embarrassed ever again is by never putting yourself out there. So that part of you is just following the instructions you gave it. Remember what I said, about the unconscious. It'll, it'll follow the communications you give it. It'll follow the instructions you give it. So when something like that happens, when you're feeling that resistance, what most people will do is they will resist the resistance by trying to will themselves and discipline themselves. And 
I'm not going to repeat everything I said about the problems that, that come with that. Well, why not just reconnecting with that part, find out what his positive intention is for you, grow the part up because it's probably still, it's probably age regressed in that little capsule you put it in, time capsule you put it in and reconnect it with you, bring it back home and bring it on board as an ally. Okay, well, I understand the value you're after. You want to make me happy or at peace or whatever. Hey, here's the new mission. Here's the new instructions. We're going at this thing and it aligns with our values. Let's do this. And it's funny, I actually do have these kind of, <laughs> these kind of conversations with myself when I feel resistance and I do it with my clients. I also teach this to my students. And it's amazing how quickly you can overcome resistance just by reconnecting with that part of you. Now, there can be some really resistant resistance that comes from what we call an imprint. Um, a lot of people like to refer to imprints as trauma. The thing about an imprint is it doesn't necessarily need to fit the clinical definition of trauma to be an imprint. And then we do a process called re-imprinting. And if you're interested in that, I have done videos. I've done a video describing re-imprinting and I've done a demonstration with, with someone where I re-imprinted her. Um, these are all videos uh, on my YouTube channel. If you uh, want to search them, just search my name and re-imprinting. I've also done videos on parts integration as well. So uh, check out those if you want to see how to integrate resistance. So what is the big lie? The big lie about willpower and discipline is that you need them to accomplish what it is you want to accomplish, that you need them to get to where you want to be in life, that you need them to be significant, to be, to have a purpose, to have meaning in life. It's an absolute lie. Willpower and discipline are just crutches. They're crutches that may work for a short time, but they will run out. It's not the worst thing in the world if you use willpower and discipline to get yourself off the couch to start something new. Uh, it's okay. Just know it's not something to rely on because if you do, and you try to drag it out, you try to increase that willpower and discipline muscle, it becomes self-destructive and it becomes toxic. So the truth is that when you do what I'm advising and suggesting that you do here, you get clear about what you want, you organize your thoughts, you focus, and that doesn't take Willpower discipline. Some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute. If uh, I have a hard time focusing, uh, I need to will myself to do it. No, you don't. No, you don't. When it comes to focus, put some bright, shiny objects in front of you and meaning in your mind about what, what it is you want. Even better, the best way to do this is to use your values to represent that. So once you know what your values are, you say, okay, what would that look like? And when you're taking your values and you're turning them into something visual, it's very exciting. It's very compelling. And if it's not, then make it that way. I mean, these are your values. That means you value them. A value is a generalization about an experience that's important to you. If it's important to you, it should look great. It should look good. When you see it, you go, yeah, that's what I want. That's what focus is. You don't need to push yourself to focus. And then commit. Commit to it. When you do these things and you're going after what you want, you're going to be, you're not going to have the time to, to stop and try to impress other people. You will be enjoying yourself. You will be fulfilled by the things that you're doing. You'll be far too busy being fulfilled by these activities, far too engaged in life, in your life, to worry about stopping to impress others, but you'll get those compliments. People will come to you and say, wow, you, you got a lot of willpower. You have a, you have a lot of discipline and then you'll just go, okay, it's not really that, but okay. You know, I'll let the person think that I'll let nothing, no harm done there. And this is exactly what I was experiencing when I was just doing things that I enjoyed doing consistently. And people would go, wow, you have a lot of willpower and discipline. And it's this, that was the same to me as someone coming to you and saying, oh, you brush your teeth twice a day, every day, and you've been doing this for years. That takes a lot of willpower and discipline. You go, 
No, it doesn't. I don't even, I don't even think about willpower and discipline because you're committed. When it comes to brushing your teeth, you are committed. You're also clear about what you want. You want clean breath or you want clean teeth. You want good smelling breath. You don't want to lose your teeth. You're very clear about why you brush your teeth. There's no resistance to it. So therefore you're committed. You don't even think about it. You don't negotiate with yourself about it. This is just something you're going to do for the rest of your life, or as long as you have teeth. <laughs> it's that simple. It really is that simple. When you bring in willpower and discipline, all you do is complicated. So when you do what I'm saying, you will appear to others as having this unstoppable willpower and discipline, but you'll just be enjoying yourself too much to really care about what other people think.